Good morning. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. In this beautiful city, in this amazing, and it's not raining, it's beautiful. Good, Good morning. Yes. Or, um, let's see if I can do this. Bonjour. Je m'appelle Alicia Cole. Je suis contente d'être ici. Je suis contente. Yes. Okay. Merci beaucoup. And there we go. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for having me here this morning. I'm so honored to be here. It's wonderful to be in a room anytime that I can talk to infection preventionists and, and talk to those in healthcare who are striving to prevent infections and save lives. And I came to the opening ceremony last night, my mother and I, and I just love the fact that you've come from every corner of this world. And you've flown in and dedicated your time to come here and learn and share and network to help save lives. And I want you to know that what you do matters. Everything you do matters. And so this is very important. And I want to share with you today my patient story and so that you can know how much patients really need you, how much we appreciate you. And just as we go through to remember that love is in the details, care is in the details, safety is in the details. I have this patient, Cheryl. She's 5 feet, 155 pounds, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure. Fairly typical for an overweight woman in her 60s. What's so upsetting is I'm a pediatrician and Cheryl is 12. Too many calories and not enough physical activity are destroying the health of our children. So make sure your kids eat lots of fruits and vegetables and get at least an hour of physical activity every day. Childhood obesity. Don't take it lightly. A message from the California Department of Health Services. Would you get off the bed, please? Yeah. Excuse me, sir. What? Oh, no. She and the baby lost a significant amount of blood. Oh, my God. You need to sign these. Your consent forms allowing us to give Janet and your daughter blood transfusions. I don't want to sign anything until you tell me how my wife is going to be. She's lost a lot of blood. Does that, does that mean she's going to die? Da da. <laughs> so, as you can see, I am not a doctor but I played one on TV. <laughs> and unlike many of you, that was my experience of healthcare up until 2006. I played doctors and nurses on television, or I did training videos for healthcare companies, teaching nurses how to give a shot with an orange, and all of those things like that. And so um, it's ironic for me now to be working in the healthcare field and working with doctors and nurses. And I have such a great respect now for the work that you do. I mean, I did then, but now I understand all the little nuances that I didn't know before. I would call up my sister-in-law, Debbie, who's a nurse practitioner, and I'd read her the script and I'd say, okay, it says this, it says that. Is this urgent? Should I be compassionate? Am I authoritative? And she would tell me, and that was my experience of healthcare. But in 2006, I found out I had two uterine fibroids. And one was about the size of a lemon, and the other was about the size of a, of a plum. And I thought, well, okay, I need to get those taken out. When I found out I had to go in the hospital, I did my due diligence. I looked up my hospital, I looked up my doctor, my procedure, and I did all the things that an engaged patient is supposed to do. And one of the things, though, that I didn't know and couldn't find out at the time was that in the US, over 2 million patients a year get healthcare-acquired infections. I had no idea. And so how do you prepare for that as a patient? The only thing you can do is trust. And in preparing for my presentation, I learned that infections here in Canada are also the fourth leading cause of death. And so this is an issue that's not just in the US, it's not just in Canada, but it's worldwide. And so that's why it's so important that we gather at conferences like this to share what's going on in every region of our world, and especially now when antibiotic resistance is on the rise. And it's so important that we 
learn how to prevent these infections and that we have antibiotic stewardship so that when our patients take antibiotics, they actually work. So I want you to go on a journey with me today, but here's where it starts. Someone far more intelligent than me said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And you know, for years, we gave out antibiotics, gave out antibiotics, and our hand hygiene rates are at best 40%, maybe at a nice hardworking facility, it's 70%. We can't use that same kind of mentality and thinking. So what we have to do is to transform our thinking. I have a favorite scripture that says we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so I hope over these next few days, you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind with new information, new colleagues, new techniques, new ideas to take back to your facilities. I want you to think about this first and foremost. Who is at risk? Because that's a big thing in healthcare. I want you to transform from traditional thinking and perspectives to knowing that everyone is at risk. I'm not obese. I didn't live a sedentary lifestyle. English is my first language. I'm a non-smoker. From time to time, I have a mojito or a margarita, depending on the situation, some red wine. So I wasn't a big drinker. I don't use drugs. I didn't have any underlying comorbidities. In fact, had I not had all of my surgeries, I probably would have been out there with you this morning at 6.30 doing the run walk. I did the LA Marathon. I did the breast cancer run walk for 15 years straight. I did the AIDS walk for 10 years straight. I rode horses on the weekends. I was a cheerleader, volleyball coach. I was in prime shape. I trained for my surgery. My doctor, I asked him, I said, what can I do? I've never had surgery before. I want to make sure that everything is good so that you can take care of me. And he said, Alicia, I need you to be in the best shape of your life. He said, think of your abdomen as a piece of steak. And I went, okay. He said, you know, the firmer and thicker a steak, and you take the cleaner the knife, the cut is clean. The cleaner the cut, the faster it mends back together, the less scarring. I got that. I was working out, I was a demon. All of my friends lost weight, because I was on the phone. Get up, time to go. We gotta do some crunches, we gotta work out. So I went into that hospital prepared. So I want you to remember that now people are going in for elective surgeries, and with the advent of reality TV, they're going in for a lot of cosmetic procedures. So it's not just elderly, obese, sick patients that are getting infections. So the start of my story, August 15th of 2006, I went in to get the two fibroids taken out. And these were some of my nurses. These were the most amazing, best nurses you could ever hope to have. They took such great care of me. Only I left the operating room and things weren't just quite right. Something was off. I had a fever that just wouldn't go away. I was nauseous. I kept vomiting. I was getting chills. And the doctor said, well, you know, you may be re having a reaction to anesthesia. So don't worry about it. It's no big deal. We're going to just monitor you and see how things go. So OK. Now remember, I'm supposed to go home in two days. And on that second day, the doctor came and said, well, you know, Alicia, you're, you're, you seem to be getting worse. Um, but it's no big deal. Don't worry. We're going to put you on some fluids. And we're going to keep you, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how, how it goes from there. And at that point, I became very, very worried because I hadn't been sick, and I was going in for something very simple. So over the next few days, my stomach started to swell. My stomach started to swell. My fever increased. I couldn't breathe. It was like I couldn't catch my breath. And my heart was racing all the time. 
and I would have violent chills. And then I would get hot, just sweating, just hot. And so long about the third day, after they took out the catheter and everything, I got up to go to the restroom, and I, the nurse was helping me because I was a fall risk. And I went, oh my god, I'm sorry. I called you in here for nothing. And she said, no, no, no. I, I said, well, I have to go to the restroom, but I forgot I have a catheter. And she goes, no, no, remember we took your catheter out. And I said, oh, no, I, I have a catheter. I, I can tell. I feel it. And she goes, Alicia, there's no tubing. No, you don't have a catheter, honey. And I went, I don't. Well, what am I feeling? And I raised up my, dress, my gown. And I was so swollen with fluid and everything was trying to get out that my labia were swollen and hanging down about four inches. And it looked like I had a penis. And I said, now wait a minute. <laughs> mm -mm. This is not the surgery I came in for. <laughs> this was not what we were supposed to do. And we had a good laugh. And then my mother came in, and I showed it to my mother. And then my father came in. I did not show it to my father. <laughs> but when the doctor came and I showed him, he said, well, OK, it looks like the fluid is trying to get out. You know, you're so healthy that I didn't put in a drainage tube, because I, I just knew your body would take care of itself. So. Unfortunately, Alicia, I'm going to have to open your incision just a little bit. And I was like, oh, man. So I didn't know what that meant. But he went to the nurse's station, and he got what's called an incision and drainage kit. And he brought it back to the room. And he laid it there. And he said, now, I'm going to have to open just a little bit of your incision. So he took out a scalpel, and he made just a little cut, about two inches. And uh oh, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. I don't know where the point don't it. Well, anyway, in the center, you can see that's the little two-inch incision that he made. And he pressed a little bit, and he got just a little bit of moisture, but not much to speak of. So he said, I tell you what, we're going to cover that with some gauze and some bandages, and we'll put a warm compress over there. And by the morning, all your swelling should have gone down. The drainage and the fluid will come to the surface, and you'll be fine. And I bet that'll take down your fever as well. So we thought, great, that'll be perfect. So the next morning, the doctor came back, and we were fully expecting that there would be drainage, and my stomach would have gone down, but not so much. So he was puzzled, but he said, OK, nothing to worry about. Well, it's no big deal. I'll check it in the evening when I come back. So the doctor left. Later that evening, he didn't come back to the hospital. And during that time, my hospital, I mean, my, my abdomen became inflamed. It was bright red, and it was hard as a rock. And my fever was spiking up to about 105. And I was sweating, but I was freezing. And the nurse came in to do the dressing change and to check me. And she raised up the white gauze. And she went, oh, yeah, it's fine. And she went to put it down. And my mother, who was sitting there at this side of the bed, said, wait a minute. Wait, wait, what is that? And the nurse said, what? What are you talking about? She goes, what? There's a black dot right there. And it was a tiny black dot as though you took a Sharpie marker and just went like that. But my mother was being super hypervigilant and watching and looking because she knew something was wrong. And she showed it to the nurse, and the nurse said, oh, that's Lent. And my mother said, whoa, wait, wait, please don't touch that. We don't know what that is. And she said, well, it's probably a mole. And my mother said, she doesn't have a mole right there. And I said, no, I don't, I don't have a mole right there. And she said, well, Sure you do. And I said, no, I didn't have a mole on my stomach. And my mother said, well, where would a mole come from between 10 AM and 5? <laughs> you don't grow moles like that. 
And so she says, well, I don't know, it's, but it's nothing. Don't worry. And my mother said, well, you know what? I would like to get the doctor back here so that the doctor can see it. And the nurse said, oh, no. I am not calling that doctor for something that's going to turn out to be nothing. No. And my mother said, fine, I'll call the doctor. And so she and the nurse went racing to the phone. <laughs> and the nurse called the doctor back. So it took the doctor about an hour and a half to get back to the hospital. And when he came in the room, we explained what had happened. We were fully expecting for him to see this black dot and tell us what it was. But instead, when he pulled up the gauze, the black dot was gone. And in its place was a quarter-sized pustule. It, it looked like my skin just melted. It looked like a big, giant blister. And we looked, and I went, oh my, oh my gosh. And I, I was looking at my doctor, and his face went white as a sheet. And he said, OK, OK, now we have to be concerned. And I thought to myself, now we have to be concerned? And he said, if this is what I think it is, it's bad. It's really bad. And I said, well, what do you think it is? And he didn't say anything. And I, he said, OK. Um, and he picked up the button, and he started calling for the nurse. And we waited. And then he called for the nurse again. And we waited. And she never came back. And, and because she thought it was the overbearing patient and the hypervigilant mother. And so she didn't come back to check. She didn't realize it was the doctor. And he looked at my mother and he said, OK, Mrs. Cole, are you squeamish? And she said, no. He said, good, because I need you. Now, I wanted to show you on the other side of that bandage. I don't see, you can see it in this picture, is where the, the dot started to fade. So he had my mother put on some gloves. And then he went to the window seal where he had put that tray with the incision and drainage kit and the 4 by 4 fluffs. And he laid it across my abdomen, I mean my, my thighs. And he said, OK, Mom, I need you. He said, now I want you to mirror what I do. And we said, OK, because we didn't know what he was about to do. And he had my mom to hold me steady like this. And then he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a scalpel. And he took it out of the plastic. <laughs> and he said, now, I need you to hold her firm. He said, Alicia, I need to open your incision. And I said, oh, kind of like yesterday? He said, no, I need to open your entire incision. And it's going to hurt. Because now remember, I was that firm stake that had gone back very smoothly for five days. And as my mother held me, he began to cut. And he cut open my incision right there. And then he told my mom, OK, now you mirror what I do. And he, they took their hands, and they put them down inside, and they began to pull open my incision. He said, OK, Mom, now I need you. Just hold this part and that part. And so my mom became a human retractor, holding open my abdomen. And he reached in because he hadn't completely used the 4 by 4 fluffs the night before. And the box was open. So he just used what was in the open box from the window seal and started stuffing them down inside my abdomen. And then, as they would get soaked, he'd pull them out, and he'd put them in my mother's hand and say, take those over there. And she'd run over to the hazardous waste and drop it in and come back. And then he and my mom would push down, and they continued to take out oozing, smelly, horrendous pus and drainage. That dot is where the black dot used to be. And now, in that picture, it's starting to crust over. And after they got out all the pus and the drainage they could get out, he took the iota form, the long strips. And as my mother held me open, he pushed the iota form back and forth. And well, no, even before he did that, I forgot. How can I forget this? He said, Alicia, have you ever seen the stitches on a baseball? And I said, yes. 
He said, well, that's how I put in my sutures. And I put them in in rows of two. Now, I know you're in pain, but you're about to be in excruciating pain because I need to open up those sutures and get deep down inside there. And so mom held me and he said, Alicia, don't move. I know you're going to be hurting, but you must lay still. And so he started cutting, and I could feel just the snap, the snap, the snap as those sutures cut, and he pulled me open. And then he began to lay the iota form back and forth and back and forth. And at that point, the nurse came in, and he had the nurse take over from my mom, and my mom went out in the hallway to tell my dad what had just happened. And then the doctor went out in the hallway to talk to my parents. And at that point, my father said, OK, this is out of your hands. We want a consultation with an infectious disease specialist. And the doctor said, good call, Mr. Cole. Now, you ask, is my mother a healthcare professional? No, not at all. Is my dad a healthcare professional? How did he know to ask for a consultation? Well, after the morning dressing change, when the nurse noticed that there was no drainage on my ABD pads and the doctor left, one of those wonderful nurses you saw at the beginning came into my room. She closed the door. She pulled the curtain. She had my parents come to the side of my bed, away from the door. And she said, I need to talk to you. But I have to talk to you in confidence, because I could lose my job. And we said, OK. She said, what I'm about to tell you, you did not hear from me. And if you say I told you, I'm going to say, you're lying. I don't know what you're talking about. Do you understand? And we said, absolutely. Absolutely. Your daughter is deathly ill. She is very sick. She should have been gone right away. I'm just a nurse. I'm a low person on the totem pole. And so I can make recommendations, but this doctor doesn't have to listen. And he's a bit of a cowboy. You as the family, if you request a consultation with an infectious disease specialist, they have to get one. And she did a wonderful thing. She used the teach back. And she made us repeat infectious disease specialists, infectious disease specialists, infectious disease specialists. And it's the reason why today it's hard for me to say infection preventionist. Because <laughs> that is forever in my head. And that's how my parents knew to ask for a consultation. And so you know, the infectious disease department did a wonderful thing Unfortunately, because there was an infection problem at my hospital that I didn't know about, they made sure that they were going out and talking to the nurses. And they made sure that whether the doctors asked for a consultation or not, the nurses at least knew they could reach out to the infection prevention department. So it's something that saved my life. One of the things that also happens when you have an adverse event in a hospital is communication breaks down. Please talk with the family. Let them know what's going on. And as an infection preventionist, explain what's happening to their body. Explain to the family why they have to put on the gowns and the, and the mask so they don't feel like they're being judged, so they don't feel alienated. Because if you're not told, this is why we want you to wear these, to protect yourself and to protect the patient as well. And, and that's why we're wearing them also. So if you explain it to a patient and to their family, you're more than likely going to have more compliance and, and more help. So as I told you, in my hospital, things were no big deal. And so for the next few days, I laid there as my stomach rotted right before my very eyes. And they would just draw black lines to see how far the infection would spread. Make sure that you are transparent with the family. Share the information. One day, my father was out in the hallway, and a nurse came up to him 
And she said, Mr. Cole, does your wife still have that black bag that she carries? And he said, yes. And she said, good. She rolled up a piece of paper. And she started shoving it into my father's pocket. And she said, take this, put it in your wife's bag. Don't open it in this hospital. Don't read it. I didn't give it to you. I don't know what you're talking about. That's what your daughter has. And she walked away. When my parents got home and they opened it up, it was a printout all about sepsis and all about necrotizing fasciitis. That's how my parents found out what I had. That should never happen. Someone should talk to the patient and explain what's going on and comfort the patient and their family. Let them know all is not lost. It's hard. It's difficult. It's going to be a tough journey. But you have to keep the patient positive, and you have to stay encouraged. This is painful, hurtful, and extremely scary. Before I knew it, I was a headline. Sepsis, Pseudomonas, MRSA, VRE, necrotizing fasciitis. It was unreal to me. Now, can anyone look at this picture? I am on my second of what is going to be six more surgeries. I have sepsis, Pseudomonas, MRSA, VRE, and necrotizing fasciitis, and they're testing me for C. diff because now I'm starting to have horrible diarrhea. Anybody want to just give a recommendation of some things that could make it better in this picture? Just shout it out. Gloves? Gowns? Yes. We've got ties. We've got jewelry. We've got gloves, gowns. Remember, I should be in contact isolation. This is what that room should have looked like. Everyone wanted to work on the actress who's going to die. My, my billboards were outside the hospital with me as a doctor. And so it was kind of like, you know how when hunters go hunting, everybody takes a picture with the deer when they get it? So in, in this picture, everybody's you know close. They want to be close. People are touching me because they're smiling and, and they're learning. And you know they, they had no problem telling me I wasn't going to make it. So <laughs> I proved them wrong. You have to inspire a culture that is committed to infection prevention. You, you have to be deliberate. You have to make sure that at the bedside, every time they are doing what they're supposed to do, you have to educate. Because what you do matters. And what your staff does matters. Every single thing they do matters. Because when you cut corners, when you don't follow the bundle steps, when your staff isn't sure what to do, you always have a bad outcome. This is after three surgeries, and I still had three more to go. They started coming down to that black line on my leg. The worst night of my life was when the doctor came and said, Alicia, I don't know if you'll make it to the morning. I can't guarantee you will. But if you do, and we take you back to surgery, I need you to know that if I have to choose between your life and your leg, I'm going to take your leg. And I can't have you waking up going into shock. That was a horrible night. They started coming down. This way, and I said, oh, God, please save my vagina. Please save my vagina. <laughs> then they, they said it's, it's gonna, it was spreading up this way. I mean, it's, it's horrible to lay there and know that I could lose my leg in a few hours. My vagina's going next. My navel's going to be gone. And it's a reality. It wasn't a bad dream. It was real. And as healthcare providers, you don't get to see the after effects many times. But discharge is just the beginning for a patient who survives an infection. And understand, I'm one of the lucky ones, because of the 2 million patients, over 100,000 a year die. I had five months of everyday hyperbaric, hyperbaric oxygen chamber treatments. It was the only thing that helped dry up my abdomen. 
I was at the wound care center. I, they had removed lymph nodes, so every day for three years, I never knew what I was going to look like when I woke up in the morning. My lymph nodes could be swollen under here, or I could have big bulges on my face there. So imagine for three years you wake up to a new face every other day. The shape change, or big boils under your arms. For three and a half years, I had an open abdomen that had to be tw packed twice a day by two nurses at home health care. I had six surgeries at that time, nine blood transfusions. I was on nine of the strongest antibiotics on the market. The last two, my parents had to sign a waiver because they said, we don't know. We've never used them in this hospital. They just got FDA approval. She could die right away when we give them to her. She could develop anything afterwards but your daughter's dying. So my parents signed the waiver. I've had acupuncture, Reiki, physical therapy. Uh, I was so excited to be able to make it back in a pool when I finally closed. I had physical therapy off and on for over five years because I would get tears and holes once I finally got new baby skin, if I was too active. So we'd have to stop physical therapy and movement. And as I told you, I, I had been an athlete. So mentally, it's very hard for a patient. You're constantly in fear of a secondary infection. You're constantly afraid of going into crowds because your resistance is down. You're always terrified. It changes your entire life. So now, more than ever, patients need infection preventionists. We need the people who are experts in preventing infection. We need you to step up on our behalf and advocate for us, to educate the doctors, to let them know it's OK to bring you on and consult with you, to educate the nurses and the staff members. If you're having a problem, and if you're having a problem with a doctor, come see me. Come see me in confidence if you have to. But get me on immediately. More than ever, antimicrobial resistance is a worldwide threat. And we are on the precipice of a time where we don't have antibiotics that can kill these horrendous infections. And so that's why it's important for you to teach antibiotic stewardship to your staff. It's important for you to explain to the patients how to properly take their antibiotics and really be a fully engaged team member with your patients. Partner with them because it's happening all over our world. And now that's what I do. I was appointed by President Obama to the Presidential Advisory Council for Combat Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria. I helped change two laws in the state of California for public reporting of hospital acquired infection rates now so that patients can get better information on what's going on in their hospitals. I work with the CDC from time to time. They are wonderful at bringing in advocates from all over to talk with us about our experiences and how we can better collaborate with them and um, any ideas on how they can better work with individual states and hospitals and what they can do. And so I encourage all of you to go back to your facilities and begin engaging and bringing in patients. What can you do? Teach, innovate, inspire. I want you to know, take the lead. Say, we are not going to have infections in our facility. And I want you to know, every member, every person in that hospital is a part of the infection prevention team. Not just the uh, infection prevention staff, but housekeeping, EVS, everyone. And I want you to know it can be done. Zero preventable infections is possible. When you go to the hospital, you're not supposed to get sicker, but in a very disturbing trend, more and more patients are picking up stubborn, dangerous infections in the hospital. One doctor is fighting back. He's using a common sense plan of attack. And as Christine Devine shows us, drugs have nothing to do with it. Hospitals are dirty. Dr. Alfonso Torres Cook is head of infection control at Pacific Hospital in Long Beach. He hates infections. He hates people getting infected. Dr. Cook's goal, make this hospital different. He told his staff, 
that we are not going to allow infections in our facility. To make that happen, he set new policy. You're breathing air right now that is clean. To cut airborne infections, Dr. Cook ordered a germ-killing UV filtration system for the entire hospital. Next. We emphasize from the beginning good hand washing, we emphasize good cleaning, and we emphasize the hygiene of the patients. That's right, the patients. As soon as their admitted patients are scrubbed head to toe, even under their nails, Alicia says she wouldn't take that for granted. Sometimes it's part of our problem. We, as a, as a healthcare providers, don't follow simple procedures. Hygiene. Other mandates implemented by Dr. Cook. Taking cultures before ordering antibiotics to make sure patients get the right drug for their germ. Patients who get antibiotics are served yogurt to prevent further infection. At the first sign of a new infection, an immediate investigation. Several months ago, when Dr. Cook noticed a small uptick in infection reports, he was able to trace it back to a breakdown in oral hygiene. From then on... We brush their teeth, reduce the amount of bacteria that they might swallow. The result of the teeth brushing policy... Our infection drop immediately. Pacific hasn't had a superbug infection in 18 months. Its overall infection rate roughly 80% lower than the national average. I'd say good for him. Dr. Cook says Alicia's case is a sobering reminder of the viciousness of hospital germs and the importance of staying vigilant, even when colleagues have occasionally rolled their eyes. There have been a skeptics, but it has been 10 years, and now I'm no longer a lucky individual or, or, or someone who was crazy. You take care of yourself, all right? Alicia wants to see Dr. Cook's policy implemented everywhere. Dr. Cook's message... There is a simple approach to eliminate these problems in hospitals. Christine Devine, Fox 11 News. Bravo for him. And I wanted to share that with you to show you some of the innovations and different things that people are trying. But the bottom line is, we must promote excellence in the mundane, the cleaning, the steps. You know, you are not just mopping floors, you're saving lives. Teach that to our EVS staff. Make them feel important, because they are. Patients are counting on you. We need you. I had an amazing team of doctors who saved my life, nurses who saved my life, physical therapists, wound care specialists, please, please meet and bring wound care, um, certified ostomy continence wound care professionals onto your in infection prevention team because they can teach patients and uh, talk with patients for you on discharge on how to prevent secondary infections so they don't return to your facility. That's very important. And it's something we also have to start thinking about when we think of infections. Get creative, share your information, think outside the box, you know, inspire and motivate. Talk about infection prevention with visitors to the hospital. Maybe do a, um, you know, meet and greet with the housekeeping staff. There are a lot of different things that you can try. And while you're here over the next few days, talk with other people and see what they're doing. One of my favorite quotes is, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. As a patient, I knew that if I didn't share my story and speak for those who were too busy learning how to use prosthetics, or too busy just getting through the day. Or those patients who didn't survive. Someone needs to let you know what it feels from the inside. What it feels on this side of the scalpel. How hard it is to have doctor's appointments every week for 11 years. To have your life revolve around follow-up care. And what I don't have time to tell you is I got a sinus infection in 2016, and I went into the hospital, and the emergency room doctors did everything they were supposed to do. But the next day, the infectious disease doctor, who didn't read my chart, who just saw that I had a sinus infection, said, send her home. It's a sinus infection. And I said, oh, no, please, please, please. 
we have to do some labs, we need to, I'm a high risk patient. Bottom line is, the infection spread through my body. I got sepsis. Next thing I know, I have an abscess on my hip and my scar tissue. And the next day, I had flesh eating disease again and my abdomen opened up all over again. And I spent the next month and a half in the hospital with two more surgeries. And the next year and a half, going through wound care and all of that over again. So now I'm up to nine surgeries, 11 blood transfusions, deep vein thrombosis in both arms. I had to be on Eliquis for the last two years. Um, I live in constant fear of infection now. I have to be so careful everywhere I go, everything I do. And it hurts me to know that it was all preventable. So I got a quote last night, because as, as you see, I love quotes, and I want to share one last quote with you. Nothing can stop you. Please remind the world who you are and do what you need to do to achieve the results. I love when Molly said that last night at the opening ceremony, because it's true. Stand up for your patients. Stand your ground. Stand in the fact that you are the expert and you know how to prevent these infections. Don't let any doctor, any administrator, or anyone slow you down because time is of the essence and your patients are counting on you to live. Use every technique, every product, every service, every resource you have available to save and to help your patients. We thank you and we appreciate you. And on behalf of the Cole family, and my mom is here with me today. Mom, stand up real quick. Hurry up. Stand up. My mom just survived three strokes, two mini strokes, and she has a heart pacemaker. Thank you. So on behalf of my family, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and the lives that you are saving. God bless you all. Bonjour. Uh, Merci. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.